Mm. Now, I love the book of Galatians, and I love this chapter in the book of Galatians, but what I want to talk about tonight, and I'm going to use this uh, Galatians chapter 2 as my primary example, and I'm going to compare it with Acts chapter 15, which is a parallel story. And what I want to show you tonight is an important lesson on how to interpret the Bible. Okay? Now, a lot of people don't understand how to interpret the Bible. And, they, you know, and you say, oh, the Bible has to be interpreted. You know, well, it's in English. We don't need to interpret it. Number one. Amen. But people do need to understand what the Bible means when they read it. And here's a mistake that people make. They read sometimes what people do in the Bible, and they say, oh, God's telling me to do that. Now look, the Bible has two types of things in it, okay? This is what I want to teach you tonight, and I want to show you something between Galatians 2 and Acts 15. The Bible has two kinds of items in it. Number one, it has statements made by God. Number two, it has stories told by God. Now you have to be able to differentiate between the statement and the story. Because sometimes people in the story are doing things that are wrong. And sometimes people in the story are saying things that are wrong. But when God makes a statement, you better know you can take that to the bank. That is the way it is. If God states something in the Bible. But if you're reading a story in the Bible, not everything that was done in that story may be right. And not everything that everybody says in that story is right. Do you follow what I'm saying tonight? Let me give an example. You say to people that a man should have one wife only. Right? Agreed? One wife. And they'll say, well, Jacob had four wives. Or, well, didn't David have several wives? And, and look at all these other men in the Bible had all these wives. And so, see, it's okay for men to have many wives. But wait a minute, did God say that it's okay to have more than one wife ever anywhere in the Bible? No. Just because God tells us, here's a guy and he married two wives. That doesn't make it right. I mean, the Bible tells of people who lie, people who murdered, people who stole, people who commit adultery, but that doesn't mean that God wants us to do it. But many times people will look at something that a great man did, like Moses or David, and say, well, David did it, so I think I should do it. Or Moses did it, so it must be okay. Well, look here what this person did. Let me, you know, we can go on and on, example after example after example, where people take a story and they use the story to justify what they're doing in their life. When in reality, they should be taking the statements that God made and using the statement to interpret the story. Okay, so here's, here's what we have. We have a story all throughout Genesis, Exodus. We have a story in the book of Numbers. We have stories in Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd. These are stories. But in the New Testament, and even places in the Old Testament, God refers back to those stories and explains them how we should interpret them. For example, Psalm 105 and Psalm 106. Go back and explain some of the stories about the children of Israel and shed some light on it. Acts chapter 7. Go back and Stephen uh, explains stories in the Old Testament. Uh, you think of Hebrews chapter 11, explaining the moral behind some of the stories of the book of Genesis. But you can't just take the story and interpret it however you want. You've got to take God's statement of what he said is right and wrong, take the statement out of the mouth of Jesus Christ that said, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. He said, Wherefore what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And you can say, Well, here's a guy who had two wives. God said from the beginning it was not so. God made them male and female, created Eve them, and he said that a man should leave his father and mother, cleave unto the Well, that's not how so and so did it. That's the way God wants it to be done. That's what he said. It doesn't matter what the story was. Now, every word of the Bible is true. But the Bible records people telling lies. What they said wasn't true. It's true that they said it. Does that make sense? You've got to be able to tell the difference between those two different things. For example, Luke chapter 2, where the King James Bible says, His father, no, Joseph and his mother, in Luke 2.33, Joseph and his mother marveled at the things that were said about him, about Jesus. Wow, they were surprised. Joseph and his mother. The Bible is very careful to make that distinction. Not his father and mother, Joseph and his mother. Now, you have an NIV, you have an RSV, you have an HIV, uh, you got a, a NAS and an NLTB and, an, and whatever, these different uh, acronyms. They'll say his father and mother marveled about it. Now, that's a lie. 
Because Jesus, or Jesus' father was not Joseph. And nowhere in the Bible you find it saying that Jesus' father is Joseph. His father was God. And jo it was Joseph and but. But, here's the thing. If you're reading Luke chapter 2, you go down 10 verses. Mary comes to Jesus and says, Thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And I've shown people in the NIV. I was trying to show them the NIV was wrong. I said, look, the NIV is calling Joseph Jesus' father, saying his father and mother. My Bible says Joseph and his mother. And they said, well, right down here, ten verses down, it calls him his father. No, it didn't. Mary said, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Jesus then turns around and rebukes her and says, what? How is it that she sought me? What ye not that I must be about my father's business? And he wasn't building a chair. He wasn't building a table. He wasn't making a banister for a staircase. He was preaching the Bible. Amen. And he said, I must be about my father's business. So you've got to be able to interpret the Bible. Everything that Mary said in the Bible is not necessarily true. There's a lie out of Mary's mouth saying, thy father and I. Son. And he corrected her for it. No, I'm about my father's business. My father wasn't seeking me. He knows where I am. Joseph was seeking me. Do you see the difference here? And so all throughout the Bible you'll find uh, these type of things. Look, the Bible quotes the devil. Is what the devil's saying true? It's a lie. Okay. And so you've got to be able to interpret the Bible here. Now, in Acts chapter 15, we have a story. Now, we're going to go back and forth between the two. But keep your, you can keep a bookmark or something in Galatians 2. Let's go back to Acts 15. <clears throat> we're going to take the story, okay? But we're going to let the statement that God's making in Galatians 2, where every word is just purely spoken by the mouth of God, this is the word of God, okay? We're going to take the statement of Galatians 2, and we're going to ha have it help us interpret the story in Acts chapter 15. Okay, so we always let the statement interpret the story. We don't take the story and just whatever we want it to say, we just make it say that. You know, well, here's a guy who had two wives. I think I'm going to add one. I think I'll add a wife or two. Because if David did it, God bless him. No, that's not the way you live your life. You've got to go by the statement that Jesus made or that Moses, Moses made, not the story. Okay. But let's look at this story. This is an interesting story. And we'll interpret it with Galatians chapter 2. Look at Acts 15.1. The Bible reads, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, now notice here, certain men taught the brethren. The brethren are those that are saved, you know, believers. These are just men that are teaching this, okay? It doesn't say necessarily whether they're saved or unsaved. It says, certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Now is that true or false? Well, it's a lie. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we say. Now these men came down and they said, if you're not circumcised, the way that Moses said to be circumcised, you cannot be saved. Okay? Look at verse 2. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas, so these, Paul and Barnabas, they didn't say, oh, well, you know, we just disagree. They got mad. I mean, they, they said, we're going to have some disputation. We're going to have a great big dissension. We are saying, no. Wrong. False. Now, did Paul and Barnabas hesitate and say, Oh man, I'm not sure. <laughs> Is that true? They're like, No. Wrong. Okay? So let's keep reading. It says, They determined that Paul and Barnabas... So are Paul and Barnabas the ones determining this? No. Who are they? These men who came down and brought in this teaching. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem and the apostles and elders about this question. So these false teachers come in teaching this lie. Paul and Barnabas flip out. No, wrong, false. Well, you need to go ask Peter, James, and John. You know, Paul's like, I don't need to ask anybody. This is what the Bible says. This is the truth to God. I've preached for the last 14 years. Okay, and so look, it says in verse 3. You know, they're going up to Jerusalem about this question. Now, to them, it's not a question, right? It's only a question to the people who are trying to bring it in and create a question in people's mind. Paul and Barnabas had no question about this. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles.
and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. So just along the way, they're telling everybody in Phoenicia and Samaria, hey, these are all the people we're having saved among the Gentiles, and these are the churches that are being built, and great things. And boy, the brethren are excited. So it says in verse 4, And when they will come to Jerusalem, they will receive of the church, and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. Now wait a minute. Are these people saved or unsaved? Saved, right? Because it says, them of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. And if they're believers, they're saved. Okay. Now look, and we're going to use Galatians chapter 2 to help us interpret this story even more. But he says, of them that were, which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, are, they, are, the, are these people that are rising in Jerusalem saying that they must be circumcised to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved? No. They're just commanding them in general that the people who've already been won to Christ by Paul and Barnabas, this is a different group. Now, they're saying, well, they should get circumcised, though. Not that they must to be saved. But hey, they should be circumcised and they should keep the law of Moses. Now, is that true? No. Okay, because they don't need to be circumcised. And we're going to see that in Galatians 2 even more clearly. These guys are wrong, but they're not teaching heresy and false doctrine like these unsaved people uh, from before in the chapter. But, but let's keep reading. It says, And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, so what are, what, are they, what are they disputing about? Not whether circumcision is part of salvation. They're disputing about whether these guys even need to get circumcised in general, period. Whether they even should get circumcised, whether it's even something they need to do. Well, look what it says. It says, when there have been much disputing, so people are arguing about it and trying to figure this out. And Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth Peter's mouth, he's saying, should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them. You see that? No difference between the Jew and the Greek. He says, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God? Now, is Peter unsure about what he believes? No, he's very clear. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? He said, why are you trying to put them in bondage again underneath the law? Why are you trying to put this yoke upon them? But we believe, verse 11, that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved, even as they. Our fathers, the Gentiles, us, Everybody's always been and always will be saved by grace through faith. This is what Peter's preaching. He says, you already heard from me before about how in Acts chapter 10, he went to, uh, to, to flip back there. Keep your finger there. Flip back to Acts chapter 10. He went to the house of Cornelius. And Peter preached to Cornelius, an Italian man, a Gentile. And he, he preached the gospel to him. And, and uh, let me find the verse. This wasn't my notes, but, but it's, it's, it's the perfect example. Okay, look at this. Verse number 42 of Acts chapter 10. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, remember the Old Testament teaches this, all the prophets give witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should be not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then pray they him to tarry a certain day. So what's Peter preaching? He's preaching a message of whosoever believeth. Right? That whosoever believeth in him might receive remission of sins. And when he preached that to them, when he got to that part of the sermon, when, he, when they comprehended that, they believed that in their heart. And immediately the Bible says that they were saved and the Holy Ghost 
uh, and twelve them, and also came upon them. Now, when it says they spake with tongues, it, or did they start going, Ooh! <laughs> <laughs> hey. Ooh! <laughs> hey. now, now, listen. These people were what nationality? Italians. Okay. They, the man who speaks to them is what? A Jew. Okay. And, and they began to speak in the language of Peter that he understood them speaking back to him in their in his language. He said, I heard the guy tell me that he was saved in my own language. Yeah. And that was that was surprising to him. Okay. And he said, Hey, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost was me? And he told them in verse 48 that if they wanted to, they could get baptized. That's not what it says. It says, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Oh, you're always pressuring people to get baptized. We tell people, God said to get baptized. Get baptized. If you're saved and you haven't been baptized, get baptized. We don't force anybody to do it, but it's a command of God. I mean, last time I checked, baptism is not optional. Isn't this something that God commands you to do? I mean, it's not part of salvation. You're still going to heaven if you're not baptized, but God does command you to be baptized. I mean, He does command you not to steal. I mean, you might steal, but it's still a command of God not to steal. Hey, it's still a command of God to be baptized. And by the way, this is not baptism. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> That's not baptism. Hey, baptism is by immersion. Okay? Right. Baptism. Jesus, when He was baptized, hey, you want to know how to be baptized? Be baptized like Jesus was baptized. It says, and Jesus, when He was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto Him. And a, and a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. Hey, Jesus, when He was baptized, He came up out of the water. He didn't get showered under the water. <laughs> he came up out of the water. Okay? Hey, we're buried with Him by baptism into His death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead, even so we should walk in units of life. And so we should walk in unison. We're not necessarily always going to, unfortunately, but we should walk in unison of life. And baptism is under the water and back out of the water. And, and Philip and the eunuch both went down into the water and the eunuch was baptized. Why did John baptize in Anon near to Salem? Because there was much water there. And it wasn't a bird bath. It wasn't a, it wasn't a five-gallon jug. Okay, it was much water. He went to a river and baptized people. Now turn back to Acts chapter 15, if you would. But we see here that he, Peter is referring back to that story with Cornelius. Saying, look, the Gentiles believed. They got saved. They, they received the Holy Ghost. He said, we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 11, we shall be saved even as they. Now look at verse 12. Let's move on in the story here. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon had declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them the people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles, upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles have turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, and from fornications, and from being strangled, and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then pleased that the apostles and elders and the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barnabas, or Barsabas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner, the apostles and elders and brethren, send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which were went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, See how bad they're painting these people? Subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost unto us, 
to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things that you stain from meat, meats off of the idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well, fare you well. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. And after they had tarried there a space, they were let go in peace from the brethren and the apostles. Okay, uh, that's the part of the chapter that concerns us. Look at Galatians 2 now. Now, we didn't really have any trouble understanding that, but... Did you notice how I made a distinction right away? I said, I said, and, and the passage in Acts 15 didn't really say this. Okay. But we're going to see this in Galatians 2, which is why I said it. Okay. I said that those guys who came in that were teaching that you had to be circumcised, I said those guys are not saved. Because I said it just said certain men, and then it said brethren. But is that really conclusive proof if it just calls them men that they're not saved? No. Okay. I said those guys are not saved. Because they were teaching this, but the Pharisees, which believed, and they wanted to circumcise them, but it's not part of salvation, they were saved, okay? But see, I just said that they weren't saved. But look, we're going to see in Galatians chapter 2, God's going to say that they weren't saved, okay? Let's read it. Galatians chapter 2. The Bible reads, Then fourteen years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, and took Titus with me also. This is when he went up there. It's the same story. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. You know, Titus is like, do I need to be circumcised? And Paul's like, no. You don't need to be circumcised, Titus. And Titus is like, whew. Man, that's good. That's the best news I've heard all day. And so... It says, and I went up by Revelation, and look at verse 4. Why did he go up there? And that because of false brethren. You see that? Here's where God is unequivocally saying these guys were not saved. False brethren, unawares, brought in. So did they just happen to come in by accident and just happen to be a little bit wrong doctrinally? They're a little mixed up about circumcision. No. These guys were false brethren brought in, who came in privily, that means like secretly, they're sneaking in, to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, watch this verse 5, this agrees with Acts 15, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. He said, I wouldn't even sit there for one hour and listen to these guys. He said, I have to stand up. He said, I wasn't going to sit down and listen to these guys preach. He said, in the middle of the service, I mean, these guys were preaching, right? And they're saying, you know how many servants have? Paul stood up and said, no, I'm not even going to let you finish the sermon. I didn't want to hear it. He stood up and said, no, you are wrong. He said, I'm not even going to give place to this. I'm not even going to let you speak to these people. You're a liar. Not even for one hour am I going to listen to this. He says, to whom we gave place to section, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Now, you have to understand here that God, in the statement here, is interpreting the story. We have the story in Acts 15. It might leave a few question marks in our mind until we get to Galatians 2, where God interprets it for us, really explains it to us and says, Look, these guys who were teaching that in Acts 15, they were false brethren. They were brought in by who? The devil. Brought in. Privily. Sneaking in. Bringing in their false doctrine. Trying to subvert us. And that's the exact same word that James used. You remember in Acts 15? He said, these men have subverted you. Okay? Same thing in Galatians 2. They came in subverting you privily. Sneaking in to spy out. Look at these negative words. Our liberty and their intention was to bring you into bondage. These are evil men. They're liars and deceivers, and they're false brethren. They're men who were pretending to be saved, pretending to be Christians, pretending to be believers. But were they brethren? No, they were false brethren. They were deceivers. They're like the Judas Iscariot, who had snuck in privily and was a false brother. You see how you see how clear this is when we compare the two right here? It's pretty clear anyway, but when you compare the two, it gets very clear that these men were not saved 
Because anybody who believes that you have to add some kind of works to salvation, they're not saved. That's what the Bible says. They're false brethren. Anybody who says, well, you have to be saved and be circumcised, false brethren. That's right. Anybody who says you have to be saved plus baptism, false brethren. Anybody who says you've got to be saved and keep the commandments, false brethren. That's what the Bible teaches. Let's keep reading. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, you know, man, these guys are really somebody. I don't know what that means. <laughs> you know, uh, whatsoever they were, make it no matter to me. God accepted no man's person. Oh man, these are some really important guys, you know, who believe this stuff. And some real big name preachers, right? I mean, these are the famous preachers, and, and these are the big names and the powerful people. He says, you know what? It doesn't matter to me. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your name is. I don't care if you had your picture in this. Uh, Christian paper or magazine, if you've been on TBN or TBS or if you've been on, uh, on CBS or whatever, he said, I don't care who you are, you're preaching a lie. I don't care who you are, the big name. He said, God accepts no man's person. God is not impressed with who you are. God treats everybody on an equal playing field. Right's right, wrong's wrong, doesn't matter whose mouth is coming out. For they which seem to be somewhat in conference that have nothing to me. And contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go into the heathen, and they into the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was for you. Now we've just read the whole story in Acts 15, and we read the whole story in Galatians 2. Now think about this. In all that story, was Paul ever confused about the gospel? Was Barnabas ever confused? Okay, was, were Pete, was Peter ever confused? Did he ever express any doubt? Was James ever confused? And of course, that's not, this is not the, uh, the disciple James. This is James, the brother of Jesus. The other James is already dead. Okay, uh, The other James is killed by Herod. John's brother, you know, the son of Zebedee. This is Jesus' half-brother, James. James was never confused about it. Paul was never confused about it. Barnabas was never confused about it. The only question that some of the believers were mixed up about was about circumcision, uh, just being, should they even be circumcised in general? But even Paul and Barnabas and, and uh, Peter and James, they never had a doubt about that. They knew what the truth was about that. But I, I've had people, I've heard people preach this where it's almost like, oh man, the early church was really struggling with this. They were really struggling with this debate, you know? Is it just faith or is it faith plus works? Do you see any kind of a struggle here? The only struggle was some liar came in to teach heresy and they had to convince the multitude. In Acts 15, the only people who were wavering was the multitude. Okay, the people, the, the, lead, the, the preachers, the pastors, the men who walked and talked with Jesus Christ, they had no doubt about it. And never one time in any, we just read the whole thing, no doubt it's spread by him. Now let's keep reading, it gets even more interesting. Verse 11, but when Peter was come to Antioch, here's where there is a little bit of dispute. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I was stood into the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with them, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Now what does the word dissimulation mean? Well, do you know what simulation means? Like a flight simulator? Are you really flying? No. Do you feel like you're flying? Yes. That's what a simulator is. Dissimulation is, is when you're being a phony. You're being a fake. This is what dissimulation means. It's a word that used to be part of it. I was reading a book and, and it quoted George Washington. He was talking about dissimulation. That it's a word that used to be a part of language frequently. It's a word that means somebody being fake. Somebody being a phony. They're simulating something that's not real. Okay. Like the Bible says, let love be without dissimulation. He's saying you need to have real love for people, not just put on a show about it. And so, this dissimulation was where Barnabas and Peter were pretending that they did not eat with the Gentiles. Because there were people there that they felt like would be offended 
if they saw the Jews eating with the Gentiles. So when, when Peter saw that there were brethren from James and from Jerusalem, they said, oh man, we better pretend like we don't eat with them. And Paul said, they were just eating with them. And then these guys show up, all of a sudden you're afraid, and you're all of a sudden you're eating at a separate table. Okay? So what, what's the issue here? Is this about salvation? No. The issue here is about fellowship. The issue here is about segregation. You know, churches that would be segregated on lines of, of race or on lines of nationality, right? And, you know, it exists. Or it has existed, you know. Churches where no blacks are allowed, you know. Or churches where only, uh, you know, uh, only whites are allowed. Or even, even there are some churches that are like a Native American church, you know, that are like a Navajo church and no white people go there, you know. And they say, oh, I'm not going to go there, you know. It's a Navajo church. I know that... Uh, Pastor Chitty, where my sister used to go to church in uh, Waterfield, he had a sign on his church that said, the church where everyone is welcome. Because he wanted people to know this isn't just a Navajo church. You know, this, this is a church where all of that, and then you know what, it's not right for people to be segregated in church along lines of race. The Bible says that God's house should be a house of prayer for all nations. Okay, And so Paul is saying here, it's not right for you to sit there and call somebody common or unclean because they're from a different nationality other than being a Jew. You know, they're a Greek or a barbarian. He said, you need to sit down and just eat bread with the disciples no matter what color they are. It doesn't matter, is what he's saying. But these people got nervous and they said, oh man, we don't want to be seen eating with these kind of people. And it's not just race. It could be, it could be financial sin. You know, poor people. Some people just don't want to be around poor people. Oh man, I don't want to be seen with these derelicts. You know? But that's not right. The Bible says that if a man come into your assembly, it's talking about your church, uh, you know, in, in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man with vile raiment, and you have respect him to wear the gay clothing. It's not talking about being, it's not talking about Abercrombie and Fitch. It's talking about having, you know, just nice clothing. It says, if you have respect to him that wear the gay clothing, and say to him, sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, hey, stand thou there. Or sit here under my footstool. Are you not then partial in yourselves and become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren. Uh, had not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he had promised them to love him? But you have despised the poor. Do not men, rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called? If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend, in one point he is guilty of all. Look, the Bible says if somebody's poor, sit down next to them. Don't make them sit in the back. Don't make them sit, you know, it reminds me of these, uh, these TV preachers, you know, and they literally, I've, I've talked to people who've gone to some of these services that are on TV and conferences, and they put the homely people, put them in the back, where they're out of the side of the camera. And all the people that, that are nice looking and nice clothing, they put them seats up in the front. Because I talked to this lady, she said, you go to this church, this was in Illinois, it was a big church that was on TV, and she said, they give you a ticket that has a signed seating. I said, why do they have a signed seating? She said, because they put all the pretty, beautiful, handsome, well-dressed people right in front. Where the cameras can look like everybody's really well-to-do. And this is a really upscale, uptown type of church. And if you're kind of ugly, you're a little homely, you know, it's like, okay, here, you're going to be in... P, P, Q, 3, you know, like the nice thing is like A1, A5, A7, you know, you're going to be in like Z, 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 H5, okay, in fact, you're across the street in a different building, you know, hey, if, I'm pre if, if, if I were preaching on TV, and by the way, I'm never going to be preaching on TV, as long as the devil's controlling the TV station, which is probably going to be till doomsday, till the millennium at least, you know. Uh, I've never really preached out to me, but if I would, man, I'd take the ugliest people in this church and put them in the front row. Let's just be real. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I don't have anybody like that. i put them in the front row. This is who we are. No, but, but you see what I'm saying, though? 
They're telling people where to sit, and, and they're saying, I don't want to eat with somebody who's this race, or I don't want to be with these poor people, or I don't want to be with these ghetto people, or I don't want to be with this kind of person. They're ugly, or they don't have money, or they're not the right race. It's like, you know what? God's saying, look, don't let love be without dissimulation. Don't be a phony. Don't be a hypocrite. Hey, sit down next to God's people and, and, and embrace them as your brethren. Don't sit there and, and uh, differentiate between people based on money or intelligence or, or their appearance or how good they look or, or their race. He's saying that's wrong. Amen. And he said, Peter, he got mixed up in this because he was embarrassed to be seen with these Gentiles. And even Barnabas got caught up in the whole thing. Even Barnabas, who was the one who with Paul was preaching the hardest to these people in Acts chapter 15. Well, let's, let's read. It says in uh, verse number 13, you see that word dissimulation at the end of the verse. Verse 14, but when I saw Paul saying that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all. Now look, Peter didn't want to be embarrassed. He's about to be embarrassed. Okay, because Peter, remember, what was the reason why he got up from the table and said, I'm going to take my little lunch tray. You know, it's like in, it's like in a cafeteria at school. He got his little carton of milk and his lunch tray. He's like, I'm, taking, I'm going to a different table. He has orange lunch tray, you know. He takes it to a different table because he doesn't want to be seen with these kids over here, you know. So he takes his lunch tray. Why? Because he didn't want to be embarrassed, right? He didn't want to be embarrassed in front of everybody. He's about to be embarrassed because... This is what happens when you disobey God. You know, whosoever humbleth himself shall be exalted. And the Bible says, whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased. So this is what happens. He says, I said unto Peter before them all, in the middle of verse 14, If thou being a Jew livest after the manner of the Gentiles, he said, you're just like these Gentiles. You just ate with them five minutes ago. Thou being a Jew livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews. Why compelest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Say that five times fast. <laughs> we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing. Oh, I think I think so. No, he says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we are believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we also are, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. Say, look, I've been saved, I'm just, I'm still going to sin. It doesn't mean God's the minister, minister of sin. He says, if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. It's like about building old habits again. You know, some of the things that he used to be involved in that he destroyed. Strongholds of, of sin and iniquity in his life. He said, if I build those again, he said, I make myself a transgressor. Okay, he said, it's not God's fault. I'm justified by faith. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. And if I choose to go back into sin, that's my fault. I'm a transgressor. Can't blame anybody else except me. But he's still saved. Still going to heaven. He says, For I through the law and dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, he's saying, the reason that I'm living right, the reason I live for God, he's saying, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. He's saying, if you can get saved by the works of the law, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? He said, if righteousness come by the law, Christ is dead in vain. I mean, if being a good person gets you to heaven, where does Jesus die on the cross come in the picture? Right? I mean, if it's like, well, if you're good, you go to heaven, if bad, go to hell. That sounds like something that doesn't need Jesus at all. That's what the world believes, by the way. Good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell. Well, you don't need Jesus then. You're good, you're going to have it. Bad, go to hell. No. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all come up short. There's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, they're all gone out of the way. They're together become unprofitable. He says, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. There's not a righteous man upon, there's not just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not, the Bible says. 
There is none righteous, no, not one. Nobody's good enough to go to heaven. He says, it's not by the works of the law, it's by faith, by grace through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ He shed on the cross, and if you believe it's by works, you don't need Jesus. If you believe it's by works, you don't need Jesus. You can just try to get to heaven on works. And it'll be like Brother Jimenez preached last Sunday night. You'll get there and God's going to judge you by your works. In Revelation chapter 20. He's going to judge the unsaved by their works. They wanted to be justified by works. God's going to pull out the books. And another book which is the Lamb's Book of Life. He's going to judge them by their works. And they're going to come short. They're going to be weighed in the balances as uh, Belshazzar was and found wanting. As it says in, uh, uh, what is it, Daniel chapter 5. They're going to be weighed in the balances one day, and they're going to be found wanting. Sorry, you came short. Sorry, your good works weren't good enough. But, the Bible says that those of us who are saved, that the righteousness of Jesus Christ will be imputed unto us. That righteousness might be imputed unto us also, it says in, in Romans chapter 4. And so, we're going to go in on the good works of Jesus. We're going into heaven on the blood of Jesus. Amen. These other people, they're trying to get in on their own way in. Yep. They're going to come up wanting. They're going to come up short. We were talking to... Remember that crazy guy? We're, yeah. we're out solo. You know what I'm talking about. We're out solo and we knock on this guy's door. And I said, hey, you know, I just want to invite you to church. And he said, oh, I already went to church today. I'm Roman Catholic. And I said, well... I said to him, I said... I said, well, if you die today, do you know for sure if you go to heaven... He said, you want to bet? And I was like, okay. <laughs> I'm okay. So I said, well, I said, well, do you know for sure? And he said, well, he's like, well, I don't know. Do you know for sure? I said, yeah, I know for sure. He's like, well, let me see your ticket. How do you know you're going to have it? You got a ticket or something? Show me the ticket. I think that was a little bit weird. But he's like, show me your ticket. And I said, my ticket's right here. And he said, well, how much Well, how much did you pay for it? How much did it cost? I said, it didn't cost me anything. Jesus paid for it. And he just kind of said something weird. I don't remember what he said, but he said something weird and walked in and shut the door. But hey, I didn't pay for it. It's free. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, Romans 3.24. That's what the gospel is. Paul knew it. Barnabas knew it, Peter knew it, James knew it, I know it, you know it. Somebody needs to tell the world about it. Somebody needs to go up and down the street and in the highways and hedges and to tell people the truth about the gospel. And I'm going to tell you something. Someday, there will be false brethren that will even come into this church. Turn if you would, and I'm going to close with this. Turn if you would to 2 Peter chapter 2. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1. You'll see the promise of God. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Mm -hmm. You say, oh man, it would never happen in this church. There's no way anybody would ever come to Faith Forward Baptist Church and bring false doctrine. It never could happen. Not this, no way. You know, I'd be tempted to say something like that. But look at verse number 1. 2 Peter chapter 2 says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. It's the same thing. Those false brethren from Acts chapter 15. Those false brethren from Galatians chapter 2. Okay. Who privily, same word, shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now are they saved? No. Then how did the Lord buy them? Hey, the Lord bought everybody. He died on the cross for everybody. Okay. I'm not a Calvinist. You say, are you a hyper-Calvinist? I'm not even a, a medium Calvinist. I'm not even a hypo Calvinist. I'm not even a pseudo quasi Calvinist. I'm not even a closet Calvinist. I'm not even a, a mini Calvinist. I'm not a Calvinist at all. And by the way, let me just tell you something. Put this in your pipe and smoke it. John Calvin burning in hell right now. But he says here that they're bought by the Lord, but they're still not saved. They're paid. For, I mean, Jesus paid their sins. You say, well, how do you know Jesus died for everybody? You know, the Calvinists believe in the TULIP. T-U-L-I-P. Total depravity. Unconditional election. Limited atonement. Irresistible grace. Perseverance of the saints. I don't believe in any of them. I don't believe in one of those. All five of those things are wrong. False doctrine. Total depravity. Man is so depraved he can't even choose to do right. That's a lie. There are people that aren't even saved that have done something right in their life. 
Okay? Oh, you can't even believe. Yes, you can believe. That's why God said, you will not come to me that you might have life. You can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Whosoever will, whosoever wants to, let him come and take of the water of life free. Unconditional election. There is a condition to your election. It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Even an English teacher can tell you that that sentence has a conditional clause. If, it says, if thou believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then thou shalt be saved. Even a computer programmer knows that if then, am I right about this, brother Dave? If then is conditional. Can I get a witness? Okay. If then, condition. The L in Tulip says the limited atonement. Jesus' atonement is not limited to certain people. He died not for our sins only. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The Bible says he is the Savior of all men. Especially of those that believe. He's still the Savior of those who don't believe. Doesn't do them any good, though, if they don't receive. See, the Bible says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. It's not doing them any good because they didn't have the faith to believe on Jesus Christ. But He's the Savior of all men. He died to purchase all men. He bled and suffered for all men. He's the Savior of all men. He died not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Ah, these Presbyterians and Calvinists and, and John Calvins are, are wrong. They're wrong. Are you Calvinists or Armenians? I'm not a Calvinist. I'm dead sure not an Arminian. I'd rather be a Calvinist than an Arminian. You know what Arminians believe? You can lose your salvation. So I have to choose between God controlling everybody and only dying for certain people, and then I have to choose between that and now I'm saved, now I'm not. Now I'm saved, now I'm not. <laughs> of the Nazarenes and Methodists and and Church of God in Christ, the Kantic, and the and the Assemblies of God, and the First of Phoenix uh, Queer Assembly up here in Phoenix with the Ted Ted Haggard, the the convicted uh, sodomite that went to jail for or uh, whatever. I probably didn't go to jail. I mean, you know, it's not like they punish anybody who really deserves to be punished. But you know, the drug addict, gay sodomite pastor from Colorado Springs who now lives in Phoenix goes to Phoenix First Assembly. He's a counselor there. So let me explain something to you. If you ever have a problem in your life, because I don't do counseling. Somebody called yesterday and said, I need marriage counseling. My wife said, my, the pastor doesn't do counseling. I don't do counseling. So if you need counseling, okay, go up to Phoenix First Assembly and this, this, uh, this, this convicted, arrested by the police uh, pastor who was a, a gay having a gay prostitute and buying drugs from him, Ted Hager, who moved from Colorado Springs to Phoenix, he's on staff at Phoenix First Assembly, and he can counsel you. So don't come to me for counseling. Go to that, have that sodomite pervert counsel you, if you need counseling in your life. Is that unbelievable or what? If you need, look, the first time I said that from the pulpit, I had a newspaper in my hand with the article from the Arizona Republic, saying he's on staff at Phoenix First Assembly with Pastor Tommy Barnett, giving, not getting counseling, giving counseling. And so you got to understand, what did that have to do with the sermon? Did somebody help me get back into my sermon here? Anyone? Anyone? Right. And so the point is, I'm not an Armenian, you know, Phoenix First Assembly. Lose your salvation. Depart from me, I used to know you. That's what, they're, that's what the Armenian God says. Depart from me, I used to know you. But then you lost your salvation. No. Depart from me, I never knew you what he's going to say to those who are, are not believers. And so he, Jesus said, I give them an eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no man shall pluck them out of my hand. My Father is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one, Jesus said. And so you can't lose your salvation, and Jesus didn't only die for certain people. Asking me whether I'm Calvinist or Arminian is like asking me whether I'm Jehovah's Witness or Mormon. <laughs> I'm neither. <laughs> hey. So, Let's finish reading here quickly. It says, There shall be false teachers among you, who privilege shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. 
For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, and, and uh, Tommy Barnett, and, and Ted Haggard, and all these uh, queers into asses, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and deliver just law, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing their wicked deeds, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. It says, For the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. And on and on and on, he teaches, look down at verse 15, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. It's all about money, making money. Being a counselor, make the money. Who was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumbass speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried by the tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they have, he's saying, they have great speaking ability. They can make a great speech and a great sermon when they tell you that it's by works and, and that you have to repent of all your sins to be saved and you got to at least be willing to live a good life and you got to turn from drugs and turn from alcohol and turn from this and turn from that. When they try to add works to salvation with great swelling words, they allure through the lust of the flesh. It tickles your ears to hear their eloquence and their smooth voice and their, their great oratory ability. Not like Pastor Anderson's ranting and raving. These guys are silver-tongued. While they promised them liberty, here's the connection. They themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. You see, God's gospel is not, the, the gospel of God is not the gospel of bondage. It's the gospel of liberty. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where with Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That's what these people who bring it in, that's what they'll try to do. What's bondage according to the Bible? He said that those guys that were adding works to salvation were bringing it into bondage. That's how he described it. God says, no, it's liberty. You have the choice to choose whether you're going to live for God or not. You're saved by grace through faith, sealed, saved, sealed to the day of redemption, but, he says, you have the liberty to decide whether you want to live for God or not. You're not in bondage to man's rules and man's laws and man's way to heaven. Jesus paid it all. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for the Bible and thank you for this great story in the Bible. And not only do I thank you for the story, but I thank you for the statements in Galatians 2 that help us interpret the story. And the statements in 2 Peter chapter 2 that helped us to interpret the story in Acts 15. God, thank you so much for the Bible's clarity and, and clear teaching. And, and we love you and thank you so much for saving us by grace. And that uh, we don't have to be under bondage. We can be free at liberty. And uh, we love you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Let's